Hi, everyone. Now, if there's one thing I love to do, I love to stand in front of the mirror and just stare at myself. My face, my hair, my arms, my legs. I twirl around to get a good view of every single piece of my body. And every time I do this, I'm proud to say that one question sparks up in my head. How am I so perfect in every way? <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't mean this in the way that you probably think I do. I mean, I love myself and I think I look amazing, but that's not the gist of the story today. What I mean is, how did nature create this masterpiece whose 78 organs, 206 bones, 600 muscles, and 7 trillion nerves all work in coordination to keep it alive? Who in the world crafted my brilliant brain, a structure packed with 86 billion little cells that communicate with each other to control the rest of my body? Now, just the mere fact that I, as a human being, stay standing and alive is a source of astonishment for me. Don't get me wrong, this is not me being narcissistic about my bodily functions. It's rather my genuine awe in how us humans came about in our effective yet ridiculously intricate form when there was no bioengineer, nor chemist, nor architect behind this amazing creation. So that's my question. How did the perfect humans emerge? Well, the short answer to this question lies in the theory of natural selection created by Charles Darwin. Natural selection is the process that created every single species that exists in our world now. Also called the survival of the fittest, this theory states that when an organism is born with a mutation that happens to be advantageous towards their survival, nature selects these mutations and passes them on to future generations. And when this process happens for the reproduction of many, many generations, these random genetic mutations become stuck as the genetic trait of a certain species in a certain environment. So that was the definition of natural selection. But this vague explanation makes it really hard for us to fathom how this process would have actually happened in real life. And this is why I'm going to explain this concept again through the example of the evolving human eyes. Now, why the eyes, you might ask? Well, I chose the eyes because the eye is the most amazing and awe-inspiring structure for both me and for the rest of the scientific community. So as you can see through this diagram, the eye is a very complex structure that no one, not even Charles Darwin, believed that the eye could have been created through natural selection. However, modern science provides a detailed explanation on how our amazing eyes came about through natural selection. So I'm going to take you all on a simulation that starts four billion years ago, when we were all eyeless creatures, until two billion years ago, when the first humans emerged. So basically, this means that you all are going to be the main characters of this two billion year long process of evolution, starting from an eyeless creature and evolving into the perfect humans. So in order to do this, I need you all to follow along with my instructions very, very carefully. First, we're going to move back in time for about four billion years when we were all eyeless, single-celled organisms. Now, this means that we all looked like this, just a little cell. And we didn't have any eyes, so we were practically blind. So close your eyes and cover them with your hands. And notice how all you see is just pitch black darkness. So this is how the human eye started. Now open your eyes and take your hands off. So now that we've established this baseline for the creation of the human eyes, we are going to move forward in time to when a small mutation has happened to trigger the creation of the human eyes. So we are going to move forward in time for about a few hundred million years. And now you're the very, very distant descendants of these tiny single-celled organisms. This means that your great-grandparents, great-grandparents, great-grandparents multiplied many, many, many times over and over again were these little cells we were a few seconds ago. So we're moving through this process really quickly, but don't get too excited to evolve into humans quite yet because you are still nowhere close to the structure of an animal. 
you still look like this, your distant ancestors from a few hundred million years ago. And this is because although many, many mutations have happened in the generations between you and your distant ancestors, none of these mutations were very advantageous towards your survival. So nature just never selected them. But good news is that nature is about to select something right now because you were born with a genetic mutation that created new molecules called opsins in your body. Opsins are proteins that detect light and they sit on a small surface a small spot concentrated on your face. So let's say it's right here. So this concentrated opsin spot serves as a light detecting spot. And now you can tell the difference between light and darkness. So now close your eyes again and cover them with your hands. But this time, take your hands off your eyes. And notice how you can slightly see light as opposed to a few hundred million years ago when all your distant ancestors could see was just darkness. Now, open your eyes. <laughs> how is this advantageous towards your survival? Well, it, it, it immediately makes it much easier for you to survive because now you can tell this difference between day and night and track its cycle. As a result, you'll be able to survive until your age of reproduction and reproduce to pass on this opsin spot onto your offspring. Your offspring will also enjoy the benefits of these light-sensitive spots, and they'll pass this on to their offspring as well. Now, when this happens to the reproduction of many, many generations, this light-detecting spot will become stuck as the genetic trait of your species. Okay, so we have just went through the first stage of the evolution of the human eyes. And now it's time for one small mutation that brought this light-sensitive spot a little closer to the structure of the modern human eyes. Again, we're going to move forward in time for about a few hundred million years, and now you're the very, very distant descendants of these single-celled organisms. However, Constant mutations in natural selection has made you evolve from this little cell into tiny sea creatures. Well, your vision has improved as well. You were born with a new genetic mutation that created a thin transparent gel inside your light sensitive spots. This transparent gel makes it much easier for you to, to for light to focus on your light sensitive spots, and now you can see the general outlines of objects. Well, obviously, this makes it much easier for you to survive because now you can actually try, track the outlines of your predators and escape from them before you get eaten. So now you'll survive until your age of reproduction and pass on this new transparent gel onto your offspring. Your offspring will do the same, and this transparent gel will become the genetic trait of your species. Okay, now are you ready to evolve some more? We're going to move forward in time for about a few hundred million years, and now you are the very, very distant descendants of these tiny sea creatures, which could only see the general outlines of objects. However, constant mutations in natural selection has made slight changes to the location, size, and thickness of your transparent gel transforming it into the lens that the human eyes have in the present day. Now this lens makes it much easier for a light to focus on your light sensitive spots. And now you can see everything. So congratulations, your eyes have reached the basic structure of the human eyes. However, just to give you a sense of time, you are still You guessed it, fish. It would be millions of years later when you're able to escape the water and evolve into the humans we are right now. And through this process, your eyes would have to go through many more mutations and natural selection for it to adjust to the dry environment. Now when this process becomes, com be becomes complete, the evolution of the human eyes is finally finished. So this time, actually, congratulations. You're humans now with human eyes. 
Now, I have to admit that this explanation for the evolution of the human eyes was, is a very simplified um, explanation that was literally seven bil two billion years shrunken down into seven minutes. This means that in between these tiny, in between these successful mutations that I have highlighted throughout my simulation, there are many other countless mutations that simply disappeared because they weren't advantageous enough for nature to select. And furthermore, for these benevolent changes, like the creation of the lens, have been through many, many multiple mutations that change the transparent gel into the lens little by little. And just imagine how this process would have happened for the creation of every single piece of your body. Your brain, your blood vessels, all the layer, layers of your skin, and even your toenails all went through this process of constant change over billions of generations to change a little cell into the perfect humans with human eyes. So basically, these little cells just kept mutating, and nature just kept selecting mutations that were helpful. And when these seemingly little mutations accumulated over many, many generations, they were able to create amazing things, like, these, like the perfect human from a little cell that didn't even have eyes. Now this makes it very, very evident that perfect things can be created when you make continuous yet small changes to an imperfect first draft. Now, this might seem like a very big leap, but I've learned the same exact lesson through learning how to properly write an essay. So long story short, I used to absolutely hate writing essays because I tried to write the perfect essay in one sitting from just a messy brainstorming diagram. Did I have a first draft? No, because my first draft was my final draft. This meant that I spent so much time and energy trying to make my first draft perfect that by the time that I finished writing my first draft, I was so fed up with my essay that I just never went back to edit. Well, this was a very, very bad habit, and I was only able to break this habit when in my eighth grade writing class. So during this class, I was given 40 minutes to get started on a rough draft for my essay. Now, 40 minutes should have been enough time for me to finish writing my first two paragraphs. But by the end of the 40 minutes, I had absolutely nothing written down on my paper because I'd been searching every single website trying to find the perfect quote to use as my hook. Now, when my writing teacher saw this, she was very surprised because I'm generally a pretty good student. And she sat down with me to force me to write an actual first draft. She made me use this mediocre quote that I've just randomly found on the internet and made me keep my sentences simple instead of trying to find the perfect descriptive adjective for every single noun in the sentence. Well, you see, this was enough to dra dr drive my perfectionist brain absolutely crazy. However, despite all these explosions happening in my head, I endured it, and I wrote my first draft. But to make matters worse, my teacher once again forced me to spend many, many days editing this imperfect first draft, making small edits at a time to perfect my sentences. Now, finally, by the day that my essay was due, I'd been editing my essay for almost two weeks. And despite the doubt that I've had for this process, my essay turned out to be perfect. Well, this is because I finally learned the most important rule of writing, that you always need to start from a first draft, which is meant to be not perfect, and then move on to making small edits to make it better. Now, thinking about this very important lesson that I've learned through writing an analytical essay on Macbeth, my STEM-oriented brain somehow made a connection to evolution. I thought that just like how Small edits make a perfect essay. Cells also make one small mutation at a time. And when these small mutations pile up over long periods of time, they are able to create these perfect humans. You see, I think it's kind of funny that I've been using this stick figure to 
refer to a perfect human. It's clearly not, right? It doesn't have any clothes, no shoes, no nothing. But I think this makes the situation a perfect time to use the lesson that I've been telling you all throughout my whole speech. That if something isn't perfect, we can always make it perfect by making small yet continuous changes. So just like the creation of a light-sensitive spot in your cell, or the addition of a descriptive adjective into the title of your essay, we can make small changes to this stick figure to turn it into an actual human. It seems impossible, but follow along. First, I'm going to brush the hair of this stick figure. And to cover up this ugly explosion, I'm going to give this stick figure a half bun on using their hair. Okay, so now the stick figure has hair. And now time for the clothes. I love jean jackets, so I'm going to give her a white jean jacket. And for the shirt underneath, I think it should be black. Okay, <laughs> good enough. Now for the pants, I'd like, I would love to give her a pair of blue jeans, but we're at St. Mark's, so I think black jeans would work better. <laughs> and now for the shoes. I think a pair of black sneakers would go really well with this outfit. So I'm going to give this girl a pair of black sneakers. Okay, perfect. So now this, we've changed the stick figure into a structure somewhere close to a typical human of 2023. Now, <laughs> look carefully. Doesn't she look a little familiar? <laughs> this stick figure turned into me, an actual perfect human being. So, wow, we started from a stick figure, we put clothes on one by one, and we were able to accomplish this grand goal of turning this stick figure into a human. Now, I think that this way of achieving things, where you start from something small and then move on to making small changes to make it better, is very important when we're doing things that feel like climbing up a big, big mountain. So to put this lesson into use, I want everyone to think carefully and think of one thing that you've always wanted to do but just never started because it seemed like a mountain too high for you to climb. I'll give you a few seconds. Okay, I hope you've thought of something by now. And keep thinking about this, but promise yourself that you'll do something. It doesn't have to be big, or actually, I encourage you to do something really small to get you a little closer to this goal by the end of this week. Don't be afraid that this small start is nowhere close to the grand scale of your dreams. As I've been stating throughout my whole speech, what makes something perfect is not a perfect first draft. It's always the consistency and the quantity of the small efforts that follow that create amazing things, like the human body or a perfect essay. So just keep making small changes, and it'll take some time, but eventually they'll take you to your goal. Perhaps you'll be able to create something so perfect, just like every single one of us sitting in this room today, us humans. Thank you.